Yeah, sorry. Well, first, uh, thanks for, for being here and thanks to Wayne for organizing this. This is <coughs> a really good example of uh, what I would like to be able to talk with certain sense of clarity of how to engage with the work of universities with the other social struggles. But, you know, it's also an honor to, to be sitting with all these people in the panel and following Peter. Uh, for those who don't know, that is all of you, Peter was in my doctoral committee, so every time I talk to Peter, I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm with again in that situation. <laughs> and it wasn't pleasant. No, it, it was a very nice discussion, but you know, it's like, you, you start sweating. It's like, oh, am I pronouncing this correctly? Is this author the right one? Um, so, and I have a conceptual problem. I, I, I want to uh, tell you two stories that happen simultaneously, uh, that I'm living simultaneously, but you know, it, it's hard to tell two stories at once. So one is Arizona State, Arizona State University, uh, and the other is Flaxo Rio de Janeiro. I'm, a, I'm Argentinian. Uh, originally, then I became a citizen of the United States, and now I'm a, also a permanent resident of Brazil. And I work for both Arizona State University and Flaxo, that is the um, School of Social Sciences of Rio de Janeiro. So I have two jobs, as many people. So the first story is what happened with uh, a public university in the public sector that adopts the entrepreneurial model. Hmm? You know, Arizona State University, for those who don't know, it's uh, the most complete uh, attempt to recreate or to create a new model of American University. The president of Arizona State University is very famous for saying that the research one model of American University is in crisis, doesn't work anymore, and we have to create a new American university. And it's a very bold model. Um, for you to have an idea, I've been there for nine years. I had five names in the change of the program, the school. I was hired by a, a school of education, then became a college, then an institute, then a graduate institute and now a teacher's college. Have five names, five changes in the name, seven deans. Uh, I started working in a place that had 95 tenure track faculty to a place that had 160 tenure track faculty and now a place that has 350 employees and only 70 tenure track faculty. So you can see this, uh, I'm very entrepreneurial. If you say that you are doing something new, you are going to be very successful at Arizona State University, even if it's not new, but you, know, you have to say <laughs> new innovative. So what I want to tell you is the story of innovation there. When I was hired, I was hired uh, in a position that I didn't have any idea what to do. Uh, and my chair sent me, okay, you, you know about Freire. That seems to be your area of specialty. So I got to the schools and work with the teachers on Freire. And that's what I did for two years. It was very interesting. The teachers liked it. I liked it. I was happy. Do you have anything to do with doctoral students, masters, or absolutely anything? I was working with teachers in schools, teacher education, Freire. So it was at the beginning very strange, but that happens. When the full mode of entrepreneurial university happened, there was a very interesting change in the university at the College of Education. Of the original 90 people, tenure or tenure track, uh, approximately 50 were engaged in teacher education. New dean, new mandate, innovation, now we have to be really innovative and entrepreneurial, and over time, 
all of the people that were in tenure, tenure positions were removed from teacher education to engage in research intensive entrepreneurial activities. And the argument was very simple. You are a very expensive faculty. It shouldn't be wasted in teacher education. Two years ago, that school that clearly increased its rankings, increased its funding, increase its reputation. It went from uh, 50 in the US and News World Report as graduate program to number 20. Everybody was happy. The salaries increased because you got more money and, and everybody was very, 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 very happy. Super innovative and creatives. <laughs> Super engaged embedded global corporate citizens. Um, <laughs> when we are reaching now number 16, we went, wow, now we are the super wonderful. The School of Education was disestablished, meaning they closed it with 40 people fired, all the administrative support staff fired, with salaries going down, um, and without any type of social protest at the level of the city, at the state, with our alliances with the schools gone because nobody was teaching at those schools, with the possibility of reaching the public absolutely destroyed. The, the, the best example I have uh, to, for you to understand the, the level of uh, damage that disengaging with the public creates, um, we were fired. You know, it was funny. I got promoted to full uh, March 23rd and March 25th, the school was disestablished. So I was promoted to an institution that didn't exist. <laughs> yes, for me, that was <laughs> um, So I, I asked for letters of solidarity. And ARA actually wrote a letter that was very interesting. I asked my colleagues in Brazil, in Spain, Argentina to sign this, you know, another letter. I have more signatures from Spain than from Arizona. More solidarity from abroad than here. And what was the explanation? And the explanation is that we were not there. We work there, but we were not there. The minute we accepted that the responsibility of a, a college of education is to do research that doesn't matter for your public. The minute you say, yeah, let's be entrepreneurial, this is good, I'm going to increase my salary, and I don't really give a flying thought about the <laughs> teachers and the students here, that's a minute that we really confirm the stereotype and the prejudice that schools of education don't really do anything meaningful. And I think that that was uh, you know, our tragedy. Uh, and it was a tragedy that we could pre-announce. Because I, I kept, I think I'm one of the few that could say, I teach almost every year a seminar on Freire. But when I was teaching it at the schools with the teachers and teacher educators in the schools, it was a lot more meaningful than when I teach that just for doctoral students on a non-required fun class, I guess. I talk to my students and see if it's fun or not. Um, so that's one story uh, that I think we, we cannot abandon that space. 
Uh, now, you know, after the disestablishment, after all this, um, there is a small group of people that we try to maintain a presence in the school, but you know, we still are the minority. Uh, and we change the attitude, basically. Uh, we are, you know, those who can stop trying to do research for other schools, and we go to the school and say, what do you need? That, that's, you know, what do we have to do? I think that we need to go back to the schools and start asking, what do they need? What can we do for them? Because when they are coming for us to, we don't have anybody to talk. And the same problems that the schools are having today, uh, it's very similar to the problems that we have in schools of education, teacher education. I think that we need to start speaking together. This division that we have between graduate schools of education, teacher college, and the schools, it's like the problems that they have are not our problems. Our problems are not their problems. That's a really big, big mistake. So that's a bad story. Now I'm going to tell you, know, it's like, people in critical pedagogy, we always start like this. You know, first crisis, terrible things, struggle, redemption. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I write about that, that's bad. No, so. But I want to tell you is um, the other side of the public. Yeah, I'm working in Brazil. Um, Brazil is a country in a process of tremendous transformation. And this is going to take just two minutes, so don't worry. Um, 40 million people in the last eight years, approximately the population of Argentina went from being in the category, in the census, the Brazilian census, miserable, so the really poor, living with less than a dollar a day, to be working middle class, this is a category that they have, that means that they're making approximately 350, 400 uh, reais a month. Uh, $300, something like that. 40 billion people. The process of redistribution of wealth, the process of, uh, as uh, Patrick was talking, you know, they, they are doing seriously representation, redistribution, and, uh, and representation. Uh, it's really phenomenal. But one place that this is not happening really well is at the universities. Uh, although Brazil has implemented uh, at the federal and state levels very interesting programs of affirmative action, some based on race, some based on class, uh, some on ethnicity, still this is a problem. And the problem is happening there at the level of, particularly in schools of education, uh, in the public, more prestigious universities. And this is the dilemma that they're having. If you go to the schools of ed, most of the faculty, there's an imbalance between males and females. There are many more males than you know, the whole field. And very few Afro-Brazilians, and almost none uh, indigenous populations at the level of faculty. So I'm there in one of these meetings discussing affirmative action, and the faculty were having this idea. It's like, don't ask for affirmative action. What we need to keep asking is for the democratization of the universities, for the abolition of these oppressive rules, and so on. It's very nice discourse, really, really nice discourse. On the side of the audience, the response was, in Portuguese, it sounds a lot better, but you know, this uh, <laughs> black student says, listen, you whitey over there. Isn't it better if you let me in so I help you in the process and the struggle for democratization? <laughs> <laughs> and again, as in the case of Brazil, you know, and, and as in the case of Arizona State University, and uh, this is happening because we keep making this distinction, you over there and us here, as if the problem were different. 
Um, I cannot repeat with the level of eloquence and sophistication what Peter said, but I endorse uh, the need of you know, engaging more. And engaging will imply double negations or the total negation, if you want. I think that we need to stop asking people to be patient outside. I think that we need to also stop being so patient with <coughs> these demands that we are uh, receiving all the time of being the super scholars that publish in the super journals and like, like that is going to solve. I don't think that we need to abandon that territory completely. This is my caveat. I think that we need to fight in the two fronts. But I think that we really urgently need to go back to the schools and start asking, what do you need? We need to start going back to the neighborhoods and say why you are not at the university or the school. We need to start doing that because I don't think that we ever did it. I'm, I'm not with a nostalgic position that we did it well 50 years ago, and let's go to the golden age. I, I really don't believe at all that there was a golden age of education, citizenship, of democracy. The schools that I went in Argentina four years ago I will close them today because they were horrible. So there is no golden nation to go. But I think that we need to really be more local. Uh, education is local. I know globalization is very important and is you know, affecting everybody. But with the issue of schools and universities, we need to go back to the basics. We need to start engaging with them. And I, not what we can offer, but start asking what do they need? And maybe in that interaction, what do they need? They will ask us also, what do you need? And I think that that will be a much better position than the one that we have now. Thank you.